Welcome back to the Two Months Podcast presented by By All Steel and powered by Go Goat Sports. I'm your host, Joshua Marshall. Tonight, I got uh, Phil Stockley with me, and uh, we have another uh, another guest with us tonight. Uh, the season is uh, is unfortunately over for the Oilers, but uh, we like to welcome Bob Stoffer from the Edmonton Oilers Radio Network and uh, Roger Sportsnet. Stoff, how's it going? Good, Josh. Phil, how are you guys doing? Uh, not doing too well. Bad. Not too bad. Obviously, uh, not going to lie, Bob, it does not seem like a normal playoffs without uh, without the Oilers in there or even kind of the Leafs, and the Leafs really don't get too far, but uh um, you know, it just kind of just doesn't feel right and let's not into it. It just feels a little bit out of sync, but, um, I don't know where you're at with this and how you feel with this cup final that's upon us, but, uh, where are you at here? Oh, uh, you know, I was hoping for better for both Edmonton and Toronto. That's a given. I mean, obviously, look, I work for the Oilers entertainment group and, uh, the team went three rounds in the playoffs, just got beat simply by a better team last year in Colorado, but this year was much closer against Vegas. Yeah. Um, really, it came down in game five and game six. Connor and Leon scored 11 of the Oilers, 19 goals. And I think the demise of the two teams is completely different. I mean, I look at a core four, Josh, with, uh, with the Leafs scoring three goals in five games, combined three goals, and Connor and Leon scored 11 in the, the six games against Vegas. And yeah, so it wasn't the top dogs. Uh, Edmonton had some injuries to, you know, a couple guys, but every team has injuries and Stuart Skinner, and you know, it was usually when you lose, it's not just one or two things. And I think it's, it's bitter for Oilers fans because they were right there in terms of Maple Leafs fans. I'd be a little bit frustrated that it's the fourth consecutive year that they finished ahead of team that they lost in the playoffs. That would, that would exasperate me. Like I, I look at Vegas, and at the end of the day, Vegas, Colorado was better than Edmonton last year, and Vegas was marginally better than the Oilers in the regular season this year. And Vegas might win the cup, and I wonder if that changes the complexion of how people see Edmonton. But I understand the frustration of the respective two markets, and my hope was for the sake of Canadian teams that Edmonton and Toronto go further than they did. Yeah, yeah, it's uh... – I know, like obviously, we'll we'll go Oilers here for a little bit, but uh, I don't know. Like one of the things that we we're gonna get you on last week, and just uh, work commitments happened. Uh, I wasn't able to line the interview up, and um, but we have you tonight. And um, one of the things I want to kind of bring up with you, Bob, is like, as I tie this back to like kind of the Leafs in the situation, and obviously Jack Campbell was with the Leafs organization, yeah. I was with Edmonton, but. Um, to me, when I look back on Edmonton's like season, like I, 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 I think Jake Woodcroft is probably a top three coach in the NHL, maybe top four coach in the NHL. I think he's really good. His record speaks for itself. Um, but one of the things that just stands out to me that I sit here back and deflect and and look back on um, was the start the, the the Jack Campbell relief appearance in Los Angeles. I look back at that as like such a moment where. I think if maybe they gave him one start after that, I still think we're talking Edmonton Oilers playoff hockey right now, in my opinion. And the only reason why I say it, and and I'm not trying to be rude or anything. The only reason why I say it is just because that was a demon that he wasn't able to get over in Toronto against Montreal and other series where he wasn't able to get that overtime playoff win. And the fact that he got it, I felt just from afar, and I don't know him, and I'm just a fan here at this point. I just feel like that must have done something for him. And maybe that bodes well going into next year. But I, and I know it's, it's harder to look at it now because where things are at, but I don't know, like, are, is there anything that sticks out to you there? Because that well, wasn't there in Toronto, but he got it here in Edmonton. And maybe that's somewhat of exercising the demon, just like Toronto did. Cause that was a hurdle that maybe he had had to face to get over. I don't know. Am I wrong on thinking something like that or? Well, first of all, uh, you know, Josh and Phil, like, here's the deal. When you lose, everything's up for debate. Yeah. Okay. You know what? That's kind of how it works. So uh, I understand why they elected to run the table with uh, Stuart Skinner. That said, he'd never started more than six straight games in the regular season. He ended up starting all 12 games. Uh, And I don't know if he was physically tired, but he looked a little mentally fatigued in the final couple games against Vegas and they needed a little bit better. Now they, uh, they led in all six games against Vegas. You got to do a better job of defending. That's just not on the goalie, but that said, Stuart Skinner had two straight sub 900 save percentages. So if your argument, like I understand why they started, uh, certainly 
in each game where Skinner had struggled, they went back with him and he played pretty well. So I understand why they did what they did, but I also think it's fair to say, should they, given the lack of playoff history that Skinner had in the NHL, you know, should there have been, and I, and I know that they, like Jake was on letters now and talked about, look, I, you know, got counsel from a lot of people. I think when you lose all, all bets, everything gets debated and it's, yeah. it's fair comment. I get what you're saying about Campbell. I will say this. It needs to be a wide open crease at the start of next year. And I wonder, because mm-hmm. my expectation is Edmonton's going to have a good team here. I wonder if maybe you have the type of goaltending tandem where you know deep down inside you can't run one guy solely in the playoffs. And maybe you have to alternate starts or do something a little bit different. Um, as for Jay, the record does speak for itself. You know, he's got the the only coach with a better record all time through his first 100 games coaching in the NHL's Tom Johnson. It was over 50 years ago with Boston. Yeah. The Oilers have had tied for the second best record in the NHL um, in the last 120 games under Jay Woodcroft. He did a good job, but Jay would be the first to tell you, Ken Holland would tell you, everybody has to be a little bit better for the Oilers to take another step here carrying forward not just on the players. Like we're all here because of the players. Yep. But the reality is everybody's got to be a little bit better and have some self-reflection as to how they can improve to, to get Edmonton ultimately to the promised land. Yeah. Uh, Phil, you got some there? Yeah, I think, I think I agree with you, Bob, and maybe you can even touch on this more because I think Woodcroft would have been in a tough position either way. Cause if he starts yeah. Campbell and Campbell soils, the sheets, uh, everyone's going to come back and be like, why didn't you start Skinner? And, you know, he did start Skinner and it wasn't yeah. the best. And why didn't you start Campbell? Right. So kind of a damned, if 100%. you do damned, if you don't. Right. So. Yeah. Now saying that, like, I would say that I only liked three of the six defensemen in the Vegas series. They need their D to be playing better. Uh, they got 24 goals last year out of Kane and Hyman in the playoffs. I know what Evander was going through just to play. Like, you know, he, I mean, to come back from the severity of that wrist injury and then to have guys slashing at the same hand and breaking one of his fingers. Like, I can't even imagine the pain he had in gripping the stick and and that sort of stuff. Hyman obviously got torqued on that hit from, uh, uh, you know, in, in game great. number, I think, yeah, game three at home there. And he was, you know, clearly it was a hip flexor or something that got him on the play. So, uh, you know, the orders were a little bit comp. Both teams had injuries, but at the end of the day, Vegas dug in a bit deep more. And they got the one goaltending performance in the series, Aiden Hill in game six. And he stopped whatever it was, 40 out of 42 or whatever. And guys, the Oilers outshot Vegas 75 to 53 in the final two games. And they lost. They yeah. Lost and the and speaking of speaking of some of those injuries and slashes and um i know listening to you on the radio the following day you were quite upset with the refing um and you know rightfully so the the, i think the refing was one of the top storylines in the first couple of rounds of the playoffs here like what what can the league do to to do something about this well the first thing the league can do fellas understand that your players are the show okay yeah And and you need to protect the top players now, when I see a stat get put out by Cam Sharon that says teams with the better power plays through the first four games of the series get fewer calls in games five, six, and seven, that concerns and, me. And, that's and the Oilers' power play is automatic at this right, point, right? Like it, it's the greatest. This season was the best power play in NHL history in both the right. regular season and in the playoffs. Like It was unbelievable what they did. And I think that we have officials that at times manage games. Now, I don't think the Oilers lost because of officiating. But I think in key win, put it this way, I'm not convinced Edmonds to play six games against LA if the game one's not officiated the way it was. Yeah. Right? Don't forget the Kings, uh, the Kings, you know, got a late game tying goal and won the game in overtime on a pretty iffy call on DeHarnay. Like, I think DeHarnay got taken a little out of the playoffs this year, rookie D. I've also, and I, you've both heard me say it over the years, because I watched the Oilers of the early 80s, and they'd play the Islanders, and they'd never get any calls. And by the time they played Boston in the late 80s and early 90s, they got the calls. Like, that's just, there seems to be a comfort level, and I don't know if it's a subconscious thing. I don't think the, the ref is trying to make Vegas win and Edmonton lose, but I do think officials manage games. And to me, that works against the team that has the better higher-end stars or the better power play. 
Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the refs are looking at a game and saying like, "Oh, are we going to give Edmonton a goal right now?" Or I don't want to influence the game, but they influence right. the game by not making calls. Right, boss. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm just watching this this Memorial Cup game, and obviously the Kings played the one three one there, and 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 the Peter Earl Peets are playing that system right now. I just kind of want to get your quick thoughts on like that kind I of. I hate thing. it. Yeah. yeah I hate it. I hate seeing forwards wiggle their ass through the neutral zone. Yeah. You're right in a in a in a one three one like I I I cannot stand like you know what I came out of the U of A program wasn't good enough to play there but learned a lot about hockey there and uh, there's certain things that I believe in and I believe in middle zone breakouts I believe in zone defense or man within a zone defense uh, the the penalty killing you see today where you see the the forward swing and not necessarily front pucks all the time blocking shots. That's something that the U of A was doing 30 years ago, 35 years ago. So there's certain things. I just think the game should be played with a tempo and a pace. Um, I'm not convinced LA is going to need to play that way with Todd yeah. McClellan next year, just because they got better players coming. Uh, but it, I, I totally understand why they played it a year ago in the playoffs. I don't know if it was quite as like, I, you know, I, I think the football and I've had a lot of conversations about the difference between like offensive linemen love to run the ball because yeah. When you're an offensive lineman and you're running the ball, you're taking it to the defensive line. You're getting after them and trying to knock them on their ass. And they don't like pass pro as much because of the D linemen are teeing off, trying to get to the quarterback. And I want my teams to go after the opposition, to force and pressure the opposition. So I'm not a big fan of the one three one to answer your question. Yeah. So what did you think of uh, Jonathan Marshall's comments to Gene Principe uh, in the intermission um of that game six uh i don't know if you remember him or you know just, what did he say exactly i think he was just more talking about the Oilers defensive zone system um and i think it's a man-to-man system uh yeah it's a low it's it's so they keep the two forwards high and then it's the three on three man yeah. um you know what he won yeah so and and i he is he does talk a little on the ice correct he's he, he's a hell of a player i mean what the florida panthers were doing there you know, protecting uh, Petrovich and Pezik. Yeah. Who, by the way, I'd have time for both of those guys for Edmonton as free agents this year, this summer, because they're going to need some cheap, good right shot D. Yeah. But they protected those guys over Riley Smith and Marsha Show. And all Riley Smith and Marsha Show have done has been, you know, they're they're part of the Golden Misfits. And now they play Marsha Show's backup on the top line. He's a heck of a player. Yeah. And there's a, degree of, there's a degree of truth to what he said. The Oilers did get victimized basically three on three and a lot of it was cc and nurse and yeah um unfortunately for darnell you know he he took the fight i bet you that never happens again no with nicholas Hague. i like i not, not with the orders leading four one in that situation but the, i was a little the instigator was kind of a joke though with, with it, it, it is in the they, sense they rescinded two earlier in the year and they, there you go that's why it's a joke yeah. right you, you know and they've been challenging each other and uh yeah it's you know if you're both, willing, have, both willing to go yeah like this is not like the two that got rescinded the one tyson jose who grew up here in edmonton you know he hits patrick kane from behind in the boards accidentally like he didn't even mean to hit him yeah and max domi comes in and he knows max domi can fight i mean max domi dropped ryan kessler one time and the second one was that glenn denning in both situations, it was after big hits to knock guys on their asses. Yeah. And those weren't willing combatants. And here we have two huge men in a very spirited scrap. To me, I did, I, I hated the call. It's yeah. a, and I hated the call in relation to the fact that they only gave Petrangelo one game. And the lack of acknowledgement on, on behalf of Petrangelo for what happened. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's kind of weird. He, it's kind of, we saw what, that. What happened, else. Bob? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Oh, yeah, like, we, like that's we, what I mean. Like you know what yeah. you did. He's yeah. lucky he only got a game. Now he's he's. I think he's going to win another cup. So they're a well-run, somewhat ruthless organization, which I thoroughly admire. Right? They do a so lot. They, of, yeah, but it should have yeah, been. So do you? Yeah. <laughs> sorry, Bob. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. It's, sorry, Phil. It should have been for me. It should have either been one game for Petrangelo, and then they just toss out the instigator on nurse or one game for nurse and two games for Petrangelo. Yeah. Like, I don't think you can have a same suspension when one guy hacks the best comes across the ice 
and chops at a player that doesn't have a puck when he, you know, and another guy sits there and square, you know, and they'll say, well, he came in from the blue line. It just, you know, it made me wonder in the old even up thing, like let's face it guys, Vegas got screwed in their second year. The league admitted they blew the call on Pavelski. It started a review process. And I just, there's a couple times this year, um, you know, uh, Kazari worked uh, game five in Vegas. The Oilers earned six of the penalties they got in that game. It had some bad sticks, but he made up the call on Broberg, and that was the call that flipped the game. And then, you know, you look at Dallas and – Somewhat uh, flipped and he, the series in a way, though, too. What's that? It somewhat flipped the series in a it way. It did somewhat flip the call. series yeah. at that point. And then, and then Kazari works game three, Vegas and Dallas, and Vegas ends up getting six power plays in that game. It was a little I, I, that struck me as a little bit odd. I'll be honest. But he's got, but he's got history here, though. Back to the well, I, you know, and he's, you know, I, again, the I don't David Flames incident. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like I just, I, I just, just, I don't know. I'm you probably, know what I'm saying here? Yeah, like yeah, I, I just, agree. just yeah. seem to be like it. It sounds like whining if you constantly bring it up. So I, I like they didn't. In my opinion, they did enough that was self inflicted that it wasn't on the officials. At, but the margins were so tight between the two teams, guys, that that's how it can change. When it's that tight, like, remember, they lost game five, four, three. And it was a 4-2 game in game six, and they hit a bunch of pulls. Saying that, Vegas ultimately was better. And Edmonton needs to pick, because I don't think Edmonton needs to be better than, uh, I don't think Edmonton needs to be better than uh, Vegas and Dallas next year, guys. I think Edmonton's going to need to be better than Colorado again. and Because I think Colorado's going to reload here. That's that's yeah. the team that's got me concerned. Go ahead, Phil. What were you thinking? Well, like, well, and you and sorry, I'm I'm just gonna change it. Change what I was gonna say here. But you even like look at that at, at that game they lost uh, by a goal. They had a five minute. Kolasar right. got booted out of the game, and they got one goal on that power play. When like I was just like, okay, this is game over. Here, here come the Oilers, and they just didn't didn't get it wow. going. So they had their opportunities too, right? They went three for four in the power play in that game. Yeah, because they scored on their other two full power plays. Right. I'm yeah. with you. I, I I knew they had to get two or three. I'm with you. They needed yeah. to get two or three. It was almost like they were too passive early on the power play. And far be it for me to criticize how great their power play was because it was ridiculous. Yeah. Again, Put us out Vegas, there, hey Bob. What's that? Put us out there, you and me, on the point. Simple. <laughs> like like you know. I would say this, guys. I think they need to limit the minutes next year for McDavid and Drysaddle regular season. Cut them back just a little bit. I think they got to find a way to involve more people. Uh, they got to get McLeod to take another step. This is again, it's almost the opposite of what happened to the Leafs, Josh. Like, yeah, you know, like the Leafs' big guns just didn't show up. They didn't. They, they didn't. They weren't dug in. Edmonton's guys were. Their top guys were dug in. And I think that's what bothers me is like a fan i'm trying to more like i'm a leaf fan and obviously the frustration but i just see the the unfortunate you know you know you see you see the pain in dry subtle's face you see you know in, in mcdavid's face and i i don't know man like if i i'd be look what connor did this year and austin won some awards last year if eichel wins the cup Oh my God! Watch what McDavid's gonna do. Like, but it's a it's a team. It's, it's also it is a team. Like you guys know that. Hundred percent. But the, like you're only is I have a theory. You're only as good as your worst player. Yeah. In hockey, yeah. because yeah. the players are so good, they can. I. I mean, how how many times have you played five v five? Like like I used to play media pickup on Mondays, five on fives, and there was a guy out there that could not skate. And John Sexsmith, myself, or Kevin Carius, if like if that guy was on the other team. And we, that's who we'd go right at. And I think that, you know, you're only as good as your worst player. And yeah. so, you know, you got to constantly grind away to get the best players possible. And that's one thing I'll say about Dubas in Toronto. He improved the depth of that team. Like if the Oilers had any injuries on defense, it was going to be Nima Linen and Kemp because they didn't have access to Murray and Cuckoo who were supposed to be the veterans. And you look at Toronto and for my money, Toronto was nine defensemen deep with veterans. Yeah. Like they had nine guys. So I think Dubas kind of did his job there and he just didn't get the, the production, you know, Toronto seven, what did they play seven straight games where they only scored two or two goals. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How does that happen? Yeah. It's, 
I don't know, man. It, it was, it was honestly stuff. It was very frustrating. It was very frustrating to watch. It was, you know, you're, you're seeing, you know, these other series, the carriers, all these other guys find ways to win the tied your Like it's just, there's other guys just finding ways to win. And, and then you got this situation here in Toronto where these guys just kind of just went blank where they were lights out in the, the series before with the lightning. And they really yeah. weren't even the better team in the lightning series because the lightning led most of the series. They just found ways to kind of get back in games and win those overtime ones. But, um, and I kind of agree what you said today on Oilers now is, you know, I, th- I think Vegas wins in five. I think they roll over the Panthers um, there because they just I, like Vegas is just a, they're just built. They're built good. They've been pretty much steady all year. Michael, you know, 67 points or whatever it is, has done good. Is, I is there a lesson in Vegas, you guys? 100%. I think they're – Don't I, overreact. Oh, they missed the playoffs last year. Yeah. Don't overreact. It's hard to win. It is. It's very hard to win. Yeah. Um, and I think in general, like I, I know we always have these conversations and 660 tweets out his things every year with the McDavid comments and stuff like that. And I know there's – it goes the same way for the Leafs, but I have a hard time believing Connor and Leon are ever going to leave here. I know sometimes we say it to joke around, but generally I don't think these guys are ever going to leave here. Um, hit, I'm a guy on history. History shows these guys win Stanley Cups. Not only did they win Stanley Cups, and meaning these guys and generational players, they win Stanley Cups in markets that they're drafted in and they're developed in. So um, yes, maybe it's a two, three year window, but I think Gordon's will be fine. Um, I'd be very surprised. The fact that you have under, you have two good goaltenders. I do think Campbell's a good goaltender. Maybe it was just one of those years. Um, it were just obviously it didn't go the way it was, but I don't think he's going to be this like this next year. And hopefully he's not, but I, and I do think Skinner's the real deal, but you have that position locked up under, ten, under $8 million. I think that's a steal. I don't know, in my opinion, with a salary cap, the way it is, um, for, for a number of years, but, is there other is there players out there that you're looking at already um, that you would yep. see here that you feel like going down and, and bringing up some of those names for this? Well, I, here, here's what I'd say. You know, people need to remember Ken Holland came aboard after the Edmonton owners were 25th in the 18-19 season. Now, I never thought Edmonton was as bad as they finished that year. OK, mm-hmm. but saying that uh, he has the eighth best record in the NHL over the last four years, and he's done it with the cap going up a total of two million dollars over the last four years. There's been no increase in the cap, and he's he lost when he came here. He had Clefbaum and Larson, and and they were. I mean, Clefbaum was on a really good contract, yeah. you know, four years at four or seven years at four point two million. So he loses those two guys. Nurse had him in a long term deal. Uh, the Upcom trade is his best piece of work, in my opinion, mm-hmm. so far yeah. uh, in terms of altering the lineup a bit. Bouchard. You know my feelings on Bouchard. They should have been playing on way more two years earlier. Yep. I've I, I don't like seeing guys beat like I like guys that'll back it up, but I don't like seeing certain guys beat down young puck moving defensemen because the game's different. You need a you need guys that can defend, but you also need a couple guys that have got some elite offensive skill. Um and and so for me, a decision's gonna need to be made on Yamamoto. And then I'd I I'll give you a name right now. I look at Connor Brown. Uh, Chris Knobloch, who I think should be in the mix with the Rangers. I don't think he is right now, but yeah. I think he should be. Uh, you know, Connor Brown was minus 72 the year in Erie before McDavid and Knobloch got there. And two years later, he led the OHL in scoring. He scored 20 at the Leafs as a third liner, scored 20 in Ottawa in the Canadian division year in 56 games. And because of his injury, you can pay him. You can do a Krejci type of contract where it's like 1 million base and 2 million in bonus. Mm-hmm. And if you're a player, where else would you have a better chance of getting numbers than in Edmonton on a team with McDavid and Dreisa? Yeah. So I, I look at Connor Brown and that to me, that's, that's, that's the one guy that makes the most sense. Yeah. And the Hyman connection to him is pretty close too. obviously probably pretty good yes. with, with Hyman and what he's Hyman light. That's what he, he is. is. Yeah. He's he not is. the sexiest pickup. And I think I'd probably, you guys, like, I don't know if you can get better than CC for 3.25 million. I know he had a tough second half of the year. He played with an injury. You know, he had a life altering thing happen off the ice. Um, I think you got to just get Nurse and CC to commit. And, and then the fans got to understand if Nurse is going to be, if he's not on the power play, he's not going to put up more than 45 points in a year. Now, Darnell's been a, get a tough series against Vegas. 
there's a learning lesson in that, but it wasn't just on him. It no. was on, you know, so yeah. I, I'd kind of be intrigued to, you know, like, I, I don't think, I think the, they can make incremental improvements in their bottom six forwards and maybe on their depth defense. Uh, and maybe the biggest, they don't have a lot of cap space. You guys, it's not, I don't think it's going to be a sexy blockbuster summer. Just doesn't make sense to me that that would transpire. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and that's our Edmonton Oilers report sponsored by our friends at Shadowfight Solana Barbershop. Uh, thank those guys for, for jumping on here with us and uh, helping us, uh, helping us out here on the two months podcast. We'll move to our uh, NHL report sponsored by Sheena Boychuk and everyone knows. You got a lot of sponsors. Yeah, we got some Bob. So you know, Nicely done. Uh, we just, uh, just uh, Johnny Boychuk's wife just got into the real estate game. So, uh, so we're uh, happy to have her on as a sponsor, new sponsor. So uh, Sheena Boychuk. So uh like to thank her so uh some breaking news tonight uh insider trading was earlier tonight and uh they had the the insiders there at tsn talked about uh brad tree living and uh, darren drager tweets out uh uh more about the all signs pointing to uh brad tree living in this uh wrapping up as uh he'll end up being the new uh, general manager of the toronto Maple police uh you've dealt with him a lot over the years with him uh, his nine years in calgary he's done a lot of hits on him others now I'm sure you've had many chats with him along the media hallways and whatnot, but, uh, you know, thoughts on Brad going to the Leafs and what this means for the Toronto Maple Leafs going forward. Well, the one thing that Calgary has done under Brad for living is they've drafted a lot of competitive players. Their American hockey league team. I, you know, a lot of guys on the all-star break, go to Hawaii or go to Mexico. I went to Calgary to go watch Bakersfield play the yeah. condor or the condors play the, the Wranglers. Yeah. And, Calgary had a big, heavy, tough, old school team. And I think Tree knows that that might be something that needs to be done. I know Florida's in the Stanley Cup final. It's crazy. You know, they beat uh, the number one and number two defensive teams in the NHL, Boston and Carolina. Uh, in the playoffs, they squeaked in by pure fluke because Pittsburgh self imploded. Uh, some would say big. Big changes. I could see one big change happening in Toronto. I don't think it'll involve either Matthews or Marner. I think Matthews is going to play his career with the Maple Leafs. So, um, to be frank with you, I think the guy they had before was a good GM, Josh. And I think the guy they have right now, if, 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 if and there's no reason to second guess Drager on this, I'm a big Brad Tree living guy. I think he's a really good person and I think he's a good manager. And he's a strong personality. You might need that a bit to work with that Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment Board, as well as with Brendan Shanahan. I think it's a good hire for Toronto. And I, I could totally see Dubas having success somewhere else as well. Because yeah. guys of that caliber can get that done. Correct. Phil? Uh, what like what are some of the things that Brad needs to do in Toronto to, to maybe what win over think? that fan base? And, well, he's got to win. Yeah. But, but, I think but, there's like, a... Maybe, I think- I think there's an old school, new school chasm, even amongst the writers there. Like yeah. the analytics driven writers loved uh, Dubis. You know, like Lou came in there as the, the you know, the big dog, as the GM, booted the broadcasters off the plane. and Nobody could grow facial hair and yada, yada, yada. And it was pretty old school. And Dubis, I think, uh, relaxed some of that stuff a little bit. I don't think the... I know that the I don't think the broadcasters are back on their plane yet. Uh, by all reports, people like working for Dubas there. Uh, again, I, I I look at what happened to Toronto, and their core four scored three goals in five games. Mm-hmm. So I think yeah. you give them a year to dig in, and if they can't dig out, dig in, Phil, you got to like you know. To be honest, I could see Nylander getting traded. That's the guy. I don't know if you can trade Tavares. And I don't know if I would trade Matthews or Marner. Mm-hmm. Marner might be the easiest guy to trade, but I don't know if I would do that. So I wonder about Nylander getting moved. And I think they need another they need another defenseman. So is there a trade where they can move Nylander to a team that's got extra D? I don't know if that's possible, but I wonder whether or not that's the move that Brad might end up making if it is. You know, the, and there's no reason to believe it's not going to come to fruition. But he'll help. Like, and they already made some moves. Like. You know, they got McCabe and they got Lafferty in that deal, and that gives them a little bit more bite and physicality in their lineup. Like, I, I think they're probably going to re-sign Shen. Like, I think, yeah. like, I think they're going to have a degree of 
physicality with them. I think they'll draft a little bit different. And you talk about getting on board. And the old school guys at times took a little bit of issue with Dubas and the analytics. Trust me, Calgary used analytics under uh, Trey Levin as well. Yeah. They just weren't as vocal about it. So I think he's a good hire for Toronto. And I think Dubas, if he ultimately ends up in Pittsburgh, who knows, maybe he'll end up in Ottawa. Um, and Dubas, I, I can see him being successful again as well. Yeah. Well, you, you you talked about the physicality. Do you think uh, do you think a guy like Milan Lucic might be a good fit in Toronto? To Brad knows him well, and they've obviously worked a lot together in the last few years. What do you think about someone like that going to Toronto? Phil, uh, you know what I think? If I was the Boston Bruins and I'm Cam Neely, I, like I, I've heard some conflicting reports there about what happened to Luch and why they moved him to LA. If I'm Boston, I think I'm bringing Luch back as my fourth line left wing. Mm-hmm. It, I think and you I, let him retire. You let him retire as a. I like Milan. You guys both know that. Yeah. Uh, it was a difficult situation for him because he couldn't live up to the contract. He was no longer a top six forward by the, the you know the third season that he was here. Um, but on a on a good team like Boston, you know, if he's playing ten or eleven minutes a game. And he gets to finish his career with an organization that he started with. To me, that's the best place for him. But you might be right. It's funny. Somebody mentioned uh, somebody mentioned Minnesota as well to me on Luch. And I was like, how much of that do you need? I mean, Minnesota's already got one of the toughest teams in the league. Yeah, but... exactly. Or oh, and Chicago. Yeah. Somebody mentioned Chicago to me as well on Luch. Yeah. I think um you know, I thought he like, I know I thought he did good at the Worlds. Um, obviously, we saw kind of the celebration. It's the Worlds, man, it was watered down this year. It was, but at the end, I thought it was pretty funny. Um, Luch was telling a story on uh, TSN Overdrive yesterday that uh, one of the Finnish reporters went up to Tyler Toffoli and goes, "I don't know how you guys expect to win with this team because this is the worst team Canada's ever assembled in this tournament." So. Um, but obviously, yeah, it was a bit of a watered down tournament. And I think in general, that tournament doesn't get who away. had a really good. I'd like to know who had a really good team, like Switzerland. Yeah. Well, a lot of their, their main guys went after the Devils were out too, right? So, yeah. Um, I was, were you shocked that Connor and Leon never went for their, return? no, not at all. Yeah. I think they were devastated. The orders played two rounds. Yeah. Like if Edmonton plays around, maybe. Yeah. Like why didn't, why didn't Crosby? Be able? Yeah, exactly. Well, he has done in the past, but yeah, like right, he played on that 2015 team that was amazing. Yeah, and that I, was an amazing I, team. Yeah, right? McDavid's Paul gone in the there. McDavid's gone in the past, and Crosby's gone in the past too, for sure. Yeah, Connor Connor won in 2016, and then went and actually played better in 2018. Had 17 points in 10 games, but they didn't win. Yeah, and uh, I mean Canada. This is how deep. I mean, people forget Canada still has like 47 or 48 percent of the players in the league. Yeah. Like we have depth like nobody else. Like, yeah, like when I mean it was a watered down tournament, it just wasn't Canada. No, like you don't. Okay, you also don't have the Russians, and you never know what they're going to show up with. Yeah, at the best of times. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, but you know, it, to, to me, there there was star power missing on a bunch of different teams. So, and and yeah, Switzerland had a good. I mean, there's some wonderful stories. Germany. I mean, Germany without dry settle getting the silver. Yeah. Latvia winning the bronze, but I wouldn't from a Canadian. I'll tell you the one guy that if I was, there's two players that I would look at from that tournament that caught my eye. Cause I'm always looking for cheap inexpensive players. Yeah. Okay. Michael Carcone for Canada. That was mostly in the American league this year. And Drew O'Connor for the U S that played in Pittsburgh and couldn't play regularly. Those were the two guys. If I'm an NHL team, I'm going, okay, well there's a couple guys. I wonder whether or not they can help us in a bottom six role. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we'll finish up on our Flames report. I'll throw also over to Phil here, uh, sponsored by our friends at Marlou Barbershop in Calgary. So, Phil, you're the Flames guy. Conroy, new GM. What do you got for Stoff here? Yeah, so so just uh, wh- how do you feel about Craig Conroy and uh, how important is this coaching hire for him as his uh, first order of business in Calgary? And, so, and who are maybe some candidates too? So, Phil, I'm not from the retread school, okay? Tell you what. It worked pretty well with Jay Woodcroft in Edmonton, right? Like it, he was like Todd McClellan was a real good coach. Tippett was a good coach. Hitch can coach, but the guy that's got the players to perform the best has been Jay Woodcroft. So now, when I look at uh, 
when I look at the Rangers and we're hearing that they're looking at Lavi Alex, if I'm the Rangers, the guy I go with is Knobloch. 100%. Like to me, that's that's and and I I actually tweeted out a member of the Flames organization about two weeks after you know the dust had settled on tree there. And I said they should go with an internal candidate as a GM and they should go with an internal candidate as a coach. So yeah. I'm glad they hired one of Conroy or Pascal. They've hired Conroy. He's worked his way up. He's put the time in. He knows their players the best. And so to extend that metaphor, I think they should hire. I would not hire Gerard Gallant. I would hire Mitch Love or Ryan Huska or Kirk Muller. That's who I would hire if it were me. I just, I think that when you have guys that know your people and know your personnel, like what do they want to do there? They want to turn it over to some of their youth. They've, they've got some players that can contribute further down. Like the Oilers have got to find a way this year to integrate Holloway in the lineup on a full-time basis. Probably play Broberg in the minors for the first half of the season and play him a ton. Uh, and then see what's available for trade to upgrade at the deadline. And so I, I just, youth has always served, and I think youth needs to be served. And I think Calgary made the right call with Conroy, and I think they should hire a younger coach. And I'm going to be very, now that said, I'm going to be really intrigued to see what he does in Calgary because mm -hmm. they got a lot of guys in the last year of their deal. Yeah, because yeah, because I, I, I touched on it in the last uh, podcast. We just had kind of a round table, and I, uh, I have a friend who's a huge Rangers fan, and he told me Gallant is is kind of similar to Sutter in his ways of, you know, he doesn't like to play the rookies all that much, and he's a little bit stubborn at times. Uh, what do you know about uh, Gallant? Like, do you agree uh, with those I statements? He, you know, like, it's funny with Sutter. Um, Sutter treated me specifically really well, me and Cam Moon. I think it was because of Cam Moon, to be honest with you. But he always had a lot of time for us. I mean, you guys have Tyler Toffoli on. Tyler Toffoli speaks glowingly yeah. about Daryl Sutter. So would Milan Lucic. So we had Trevor Lewis on recently. Same thing. You're right. Now those guys all had success with Daryl in uh, in LA. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually think Gallant is a player's coach. Hundred percent. I think he's stubborn, and I don't think he believes in just handing opportunity over to young players. And the Rangers have got a real tricky situation because the guys like. Lafreniere and Taco. Um, I, again, if it's me, I go with somebody that knows the players in the organization better. And that's why I look to Mitch Love or yeah. to Ryan Huskin or Kirk Muller. I got a lot of time for Kirk Muller. He's a really nice man. Uh, he was at all those games in Calgary that those two games the uh, Bakersfield Condors played. I talked to him both times. That said something to me, too, that he was there. Now, Brad Malone is also his son in law, so that might have played a factor. Uh, but I, I, I think Kirk, like I know Kirk's interviewed for other jobs that he will not be without a job if he doesn't get the job in Calgary, but I think they should go and try. I, I think they built a pretty good organization. You guys mm -hmm. like, yeah. I'm kind of, if you had told me the orders are up, the orders, so Calgary wins game one, nine, six flames are up three, one early in game. Uh, sorry. When game one, nine, six and are up three, one in game two. So they're out scarring Edmonton 12, seven. At that point, okay? Early in the second period of game two. And then Phil, Edmonton outscored Calgary 17-8 the rest of the way. I'd have said you were on yeah. Planet Zoltar. Like, I looked at Jack and said, we could be in trouble here. We got to get going. Yeah, and, th and this is the NHL, right? That shouldn't happen. Right? And they just flipped a switch and completely turned and swung the series. So, Yeah. Yeah. Well, we we kind of touched on it earlier about um like we said Vegas missed the playoffs and then look at them this year. Like, do you do you feel like Calgary could do kind of a similar thing next year? Yes, I yeah. expect Calgary. I expect Calgary to make the playoffs next year. Yeah, I think we've kind of mentioned that too that they should have a bounce back year. So yeah, um, yeah, I I think Calgary makes the playoffs. All right, Bosco, you got anything on Calgary? Uh, I think that's it. Um, I know you got one more for, for him, and then I'm going to close out with a Patrick Waugh question for Stoff. But uh, you got one more question, uh, friend of the pod. But uh, go ahead there. Yeah. So, so friend of the podcast, Mike Fuda, we we know it's public knowledge now. He did interview for the job in Calgary and uh, was unsuccessful. Uh, do, you, do you see Mike Fuda getting uh, another crack in the NHL somewhere? Yes, but not as a general manager. I think he gets a shot in an assistant GM role or in a support role. 
So, I mean, I like Mike. He's a nice guy. Um, I don't know how far up he was in LA in terms of the decision making. Like, if you look at it, uh, they had Lombardi and Hextall. Those are pretty dominant personalities. Yeah. Was he third? Was he fourth there? I don't know. I l- he's a great interview. He's good whenever he's on your guys' podcast. But I'm I'm being pragmatic yeah. here. I think it's like Lawton. I don't think Lawton's going to get another NHL GM job. I think that he'll at some point have to come work for a team in a in a support role, like a director of pro, director of amateur. And and I think amateur is harder. I think director of pro would make more sense at this stage. Yeah. Yeah, just definitely a guy we're rooting for. So I thought we'd get your opinion. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Yeah. Um, do you, uh, final question here, do you uh, see, uh, you know, Patrick Wally, obviously he's here with the Memorial Cup. Uh, I don't know if he's been doing some interviews with the Blue Jackets or what's going to happen here, there. Uh, there's still some openings, but. Uh, Somebody mentioned the Rangers to me. Yeah. So do you, yeah. see, do you see him get back in the NHL here? Yes, I do. <laughs> this year or maybe next year, would you say? No, I think. I think he'll be a head coach this upcoming season in the NHL. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, I think he's a pretty good coach. It worked, it's funny how it worked out in Colorado. I don't know if you guys remember this, but when Pete Chiarelli was let go, I listed uh, Kelly McCrimmon and Chris McFarland in the top sort of three or four guys. And McFarland was the guy that picked up the pieces after Wa pulled the shoot on them that, that year. He hired Jared Bednar, and they had that terrible 16-17 season. And then the rest is history in Colorado. And those guys won the Calder Cup together in Columbus, which is saying something, because Columbus is a cheap organization. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything you're, more, you're looking looking forward to here? Are you guys going to the Combine, you and Cam? Or- no, we're not going to the Combine. Not that I know of. Yeah. Um, I know in so, the past you guys have, so that's why I asked. But uh... yeah, no, we well, we we don't have a first round pick, so there's like you go to the you go to the combine when you have a top ten pick. We don't have a top ten pick. Yeah, we have not been the last time we were at the combine would have been, uh, I guess, was it 2019? 20, I think 2019 might have even been 2018. Yeah. Tony Brar was with us, so it must have been 2019 because we yeah. got stopped at the border in buffalo so yeah uh, yeah so 2019 in buffalo yeah we're not going to the combine i don't even know if i'm going to the draft um i'm going to be very intrigued to see who gets the ottawa ownership um and i'm going to be i mean some of these coaches hirings are going to be really interesting and again i'm going to assume drager's right it's going to be really interesting to see how tree living does in deal yeah for sure um cup prediction stuff you got i know yeah five games that's it vegas and five yeah phil um i don't know if you remember um when we had you on last we did our stanley cup playoff predictions and uh i told you that florida was going to be boston in seven so i'm gonna stick with florida in five wow (laughs) <laughs> holy crap phil good for you phil if that happens i'll say hey phil from the two i'm just podcast. getting the uh i'm just getting those la king vibes you know when they just went couldn't stop them so well except bobrovsky's played even better than jonathan quick did back then who do you got josh oh yeah i got vegas in seven because i i, I want to say even five to be honest too stuff like i, I i'm i'm stopped I've learned to not uh, go against your predictions and your thoughts. Well, I've that. I've only had a 500 year this year in the playoffs, you yeah, guys. Yeah, uh, but in the and by the way, we're never doing the Oilers again. And that's going to be a new rule on Chorus. I'm yeah, saying. yeah. Because I mean, we ha- you know we're we're saying Edmonton no matter what. Yeah. So we're just going to bypass it. We'll yeah. do seven rounds. Let's let's put it this way. Let's hope we do seven rounds in game round one next year, three rounds in game two or yeah. round two. Our three, yeah, three series in game two, seven, seven series in game in round one, three, uh, three series in round two, one series in round three, and we're not doing a final next year. Yeah, is the orders in? That that would be perfect. Perfect. Be awesome. Perfect. All right, all right, stop. Uh, enjoy the week. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Well, uh, we'll chat with thanks, you, Bob. You bet. See you later. Uh, huge thanks to Stoff for joining us again. Uh, another good interview uh, by him. Obviously, he uh, he brings the heat uh, early and often in a podcast and gets very engaged. Uh, 
you know, your thoughts, Phil, on this interview and, you know, kind of what was said here. I think uh, the biggest thing we're taking away is, is Brad Tree living going to the Toronto Maple Leafs, but uh, anything else that kind of stuck out to you? Yeah, it's, I think Euler fans are going to love this podcast. As, as you know, Bob's always a big, uh, big one for us to get. Uh, yeah. So always appreciate him coming on and giving us that, uh, that bump with, with all the Euler fans and, not only just the Oilers fans, I think he's a he's a pretty well respected guy around the NHL, and you know the guy really knows his stuff. So I just yeah, we got to touch on uh, Flames yeah. too and playoffs, and he's got a good pulse. Of always the always good NHL. So I, I absolutely, just, yeah, you know, and um, you know he's he's very smart. Uh, they definitely uh, listen and uh, view his opinion um big time in that organization so uh you know definitely brings the heat it's always a fun interview with stuff we uh definitely uh definitely enjoy uh getting those interviews out and yeah man i'm hoping our boy foods finds uh finds a home here i know he's close to brad. absolutely maybe brad brings him into uh the Leafs organization um you know it helps out in that because uh, i think mike food could bring it brings a lot of value so um that's another one i'm looking forward to too is just kind of seeing where foods ends up line, lining up here because I do think he gets back in the NHL and um you know if, if Brad he will he will get back in oh yeah for sure yeah all right um yeah man just enjoy some Memorial Cup here it's been uh, it's been pretty good games uh I think we're gonna have Craig Button on I think it's Thursday morning I believe so uh so I'll be our next interview and then uh, following that uh, we got uh, Riley Sheehan. Uh, former NHLer, and uh, he went overseas this year, and um, yeah, so he's still, still, still playing, and uh, he's got his uh, his own podcast with Tyler Smith, uh, who we also had on our podcast, uh, Speak Your Mind. So we're looking forward to having that interview in the in the next few days. But yeah, man, I'm I'm a bit wear uh, drained out here, man. I'm pretty tired. Uh, it probably sounds in my voice. It's been uh, it's been a tough go at work, but uh, just looking to get some rest recovery this week and gets but also get some podcasts out ca- catch up on some news notes around the league and um yeah i gotta i owe you a dinner so um uh, looking forward <laughs> to having that dinner tomorrow but uh yeah and you got a you got a cool uh listing with uh sheena boychuk tomorrow eh so that's gonna be pretty sweet yeah so uh she's yeah awesome. sheena boychuk reached out to me today and we gotta we're gonna go do a photo shoot for her tomorrow. So I yeah. appreciate that. Uh Sheena Boychuk, realtor here in Edmonton. Yeah. Sponsors the show. So yeah. Give her a call if you're looking to sell your home. Yeah, exactly. So uh you guys got all that information earlier in the pod. So and there will be a link in the show notes for all that stuff too. So um yeah. Uh, anything else you want to add before we sign out, Phil? Not nothing else, man. Just uh, you know. As as a Flames fan, like I said in the last uh, podcast, it, it it hurts to watch Matthew Kachuk do what he's doing, but at the same time, you're you're rooting for him too because he he just really, you, you know, he's hungry for that cup, and it's always good to see those guys who are hungry for the cup actually uh, having some success. So yeah, you know what, I'm I'm rooting for him, rooting for the Panthers. So yeah, exactly. All right. Yeah. And I'm, uh, you know, kind of be nice to see, uh, Bruce Cassidy win here. Um, but, uh, you know, also Paul Marie. So it's, uh, I just hope it's a cup final, a good cup final. I hope it's long. So, uh, if it's short, then I don't, it, like, I don't stop. And you guys are predicting five games on each side, but I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping for a game. I should have, I should have, I should have bet stuff for a steak dinner, right? Eh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The rev, eh? He's not happy. He still wants steak dinner. So, <laughs> Yeah, he's looking for that thing. yeah exactly um yeah uh, i guess yeah we'll close out we'll uh we'll chat with you guys in a few days uh be humble be kind and uh, we'll be back with another episode here in uh in a few days